extreme breast tenderness, excess hair growth, aching teeth. These are just some of the things I had to deal with when I was pregnant. And we're only scratching the surface of the list. And I'm not gonna lie though, some of the hair growth was nice. Yes, this is all mine. Most sex ed focuses on how not to get pregnant, but what if you are or wanna be someday? I can tell you there was so much I never knew about pregnancy and birth until another human being was literally growing inside of my body. Whew. Hi, I'm Shan Boudram, birther of two babies, and this is Crash Course Sex Ed. All right, let's start with getting pregnant. Once a month during ovulation, an ovary releases an egg, which stays in the fallopian tube for about 12 to 24 hours. And if a sperm doesn't come by through PNV sex or artificial insemination, the egg calls it quits. The uterus sheds the lining, it prepared for a fertilized egg, contracts to get all that lining out, and boom, period cramps. Now, sperm can survive around five days in the fallopian tubes, camping out in case an egg shows up. So if someone with a uterus has unprotected sex, either on ovulation day or up to five days before it, that's when they have the highest chance of getting pregnant. This is called the fertile window and it varies from body to body. Many people try for months or even years to get pregnant for lots of reasons. Menstrual cycles aren't always easy to track and age is a big factor. Everyone's fertility decreases as we get older. Sperm health and mobility are also important when it comes to getting pregnant. But let's say that everything goes swimmingly. What next? The egg gets fertilized by the sperm and then makes its way to the uterus. During this journey, there's a risk of the egg getting stuck, causing an ectopic pregnancy, AKA any pregnancy that develops outside the uterus. About 2% of pregnancies are ectopic and they require immediate medical attention. Ideally though, that fertilized egg travels into the uterus and embeds itself into the nice cozy endometrial tissue. This is called implantation and it might come with cramping and very light bleeding. Sometimes though, implantation doesn't happen for any number of reasons. The egg might not be viable because of things like genetic abnormalities or uterine scarring from medical conditions might make it harder for the egg to attach. Research shows about half of all fertilized eggs don't implant and it's estimated that 10 to 20% of known pregnancies end in miscarriage, which is the loss of pregnancy before the 20th week. After week 20, it's referred to as a stillbirth. Most miscarriages happen because the fetus simply wasn't developing properly. But despite the fact that miscarriages are common and a natural part of the reproductive process, there's still a lot of shame and stigma around pregnancy loss. The truth is miscarriages can be devastating. So there's no room to add any unnecessary shame to the experience. All right, back to it. If everything keeps moving forward, that fertilized egg will divide in two parts. One becomes an embryo and eventually a fetus and one becomes a placenta. The placenta is a temporary organ attached to the uterine wall on one side and the fetus on the other. Everything the fetus needs goes from the parent's bloodstream through the placenta, down the umbilical cord and to the fetus. Pregnant people are out here growing a whole life support system. The placenta produces its own specialized hormones too. HCG thickens the uterine lining and stops menstruation while HPL prepares the body for breastfeeding and helps the fetus get nutrients. Those definitely aren't the only hormonal changes though. Estrogen and progesterone levels also go up and lots of other specialized hormones start swirling around. And that has an effect on pretty much everything. A typical pregnancy is about 40 weeks divided into three trimesters and the symptoms start right off the bat. The first trimester is when all the fetus's major body systems and organs are forming. So most pregnant folks feel exhausted and really everything that happens when someone is pregnant is sort of hijacking their system for the benefit of the fetus. Take morning sickness, which can actually happen at any time of day. Experts think it might be a protective adaptation. If you feel sick, you're gonna avoid food and other substances that might be harmful to the fetus. Did knowing that make me feel any better about the 20 straight weeks that I felt like I was in a dinghy and choppy waters? Not so much. Breasts might be painful because hormones are causing them to grow and swell and all the ducts inside are preparing to produce milk for breastfeeding. And a pregnant person's feet might even grow because a hormone called relaxin makes ligaments stretchier to prepare the pelvis to expand during birth. Meanwhile, the labia may also increase in size and the vulva, vagina, and cervix may change color because of increased blood flow. And speaking of blood flow, get this. If you get pregnant, your blood volume significantly increases, sometimes as much as doubling. This can lead to nosebleeds. And this is the reason why a pregnant person's nose might look bigger too. 
Maybe Pinocchio wasn't a liar after all. I remember feeling so shocked by a lot of these symptoms. American culture tends to be pretty heavy on the whole motherhood is a gift thing and doesn't leave a lot of room for the messy reality. But knowing what to expect when expecting can make all the difference. And luckily, lots of the worst symptoms subside by the second trimester. If you're pregnant, you'll likely start to feel the fetus move about 16 to 20 weeks in, which can be a magical moment. What's less magical is that your rib cage expands and your uterus grows, pushing aside other organs. That's why it may feel harder to catch your breath in later pregnancy, why you gotta pee all the time, and why you can't eat large meals. Everything is just squished. Finally, in the last few weeks of the third trimester, the fetus drops lower into the pelvis and the process of getting that baby out begins. There are three stages of childbirth and it takes a lot longer than it looks in the movies. The first stage is usually the longest and it's divided into early labor and active labor. Early labor can take hours or even days. It's when the uterus starts squeezing to push the baby down into the cervix. Those are contractions. The cervix begins to thin and also opens or dilates to around six centimeters and the body starts clearing out some of the protections it built for the fetus. Like, the cervix forms a protective covering of mucus to make sure nothing harmful gets in. This is called a mucus plug, and it can be loosened and expelled by early contractions, though a lot of folks lose it days or weeks before beginning labor. Then, there's this fluid-filled bag that the fetus has been hanging out in called the amniotic sac. This usually bursts during the first stage of labor. That's what it means for someone's water to break, and it can happen in a gush or a less dramatic trickle. Once the cervix is around five to six centimeters dilated and contractions are less than five minutes apart, active labor has begun. This is typically more intense and it's what takes the cervix all the way to 10 centimeters, big enough for the baby's grand entrance. When it comes to delivery, there are a few different methods. We'll start with the most common, vaginal delivery. About seven out of 10 births in the US happen this way. Once the cervix is fully dilated, the second stage of labor kicks off called the pushing stage. If you're delivering, you may feel an urge to push or your body may push for you thanks to something called the fetus ejection reflex. Now, despite a 10 centimeter hole opening up in the cervix, the vagina still needs to stretch for the fetus to pass through. Nine in 10 first timers report experiencing some kind of vaginal tearing during birth or something called an episiotomy, where a member of the birth team makes a small cut in the vaginal opening. Thankfully, after the shoulders are out, the rest of the body follows pretty fast and voila, a baby. But hang on, because the third stage of birth is the delivery of the placenta. Most people find this part a lot easier than delivering a baby. Now, as for the three out of 10 births that aren't vaginal deliveries, first, there's an assisted vaginal delivery where the doctor uses forceps or suction to help pull the baby out. And sometimes a C-section or cesarean birth might be necessary. This is when the doctor makes an incision in the abdomen and uterus and removes the baby that way. There are so many ways that birth happens, but once all is said and done, well, the journey's just beginning. While birth may be over, the fourth trimester has just begun. Also known as the newborn phase, the fourth trimester is those first three months after birth. It is a key stage of development for both baby and parent. And for the person who just gave birth, their body won't be back to business as usual for a while. For the first six weeks, the person who gave birth can expect bleeding and cramping as the uterus contracts to its normal size. Cramping also happens because oxytocin, the hormone released during breastfeeding, is the same one that triggers contractions. And while the uterus may remain a little bigger after giving birth, it's a myth that the vagina gets permanently stretched out. For most people, it goes back to its pre-birth shape and size in about three to six months. Though, doctors do recommend that people who just gave birth pay special attention to any weakening in their pelvic floor, the group of muscles in the pelvis that sort of holds everything together. So there you go. Pregnancy and childbirth in a nutshell, or should I say a uterus. Having a baby is a long complex process where the body undergoes huge changes. It's also something humans have been doing for as long as there have been humans. And it's as strange and awe-inspiring as ever. If you wanna learn more, check out the links in the description. Next time, we're wading into some deep waters and talking about abortion. See you then. This episode of Crash Course Sex Ed was produced in partnership with the Kinsey Institute at Indiana University. If you are interested in learning more, visit their website for resources that explore the topics we discussed in the video today. Thanks for watching this episode, which was filmed at our studio in Indianapolis and was made with all the help of these former babies. 
If you want to help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever, you can join our community on Patreon. Patreon.